uh, making it about the unprodigal father and that the father in this story in Luke 15 represents the father and the two sons represent two different angles of Christian. Um, and then we read scriptures that identified that there is a sonship beyond just being born again. <clears throat> and it is Christ, the Son of God, within us in his life. Um, uh, I don't normally start with a joke, joke, but I think I will. Bless you, bless you. Uh, St. Peter's at the pearly gates, you know, waiting to examine people. And so <clears throat> Jesus comes walking by and Peter said, Jesus, could you watch the gate for a little while? I, I won't be very long. And Jesus goes, sure, sure. Uh, what do I got to do? And he said, well, you just, you just sit over there at the examination table with him and talk to him a little while and see if they're worthy to get in. And so Jesus says, sure. And uh, so he sits down at the table, and the first person that walks up is this really old, wrinkly old man. He sits down, and Jesus says, well, what did you do for a living? And he said, well, I was a carpenter. And Jesus thought, yeah, that's good, that's good. And then he said, uh, he said, well, what was your family life like? And he said, well, I had a son, but I lost him. And Jesus kind of leaned in a little bit, and uh, he said, uh, well, what was he like? He said, well, he had holes in his hands and in his feet. And Jesus leans in even closer and says, Father? And the man leans into him and says, Pinocchio? <laughs> if you didn't get it, talk to, talk to Scott. I think he left first. Okay, Luke 15 Verse 23, uh, we're going to do the last part of 23 and 24, and then we're going to do 31 and 32. <clears throat> All right, so just starting at the last part of verse 23, let us eat and be merry. And then verse 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And then verse 31 and 32, this is uh, the father speaking to his elder son. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. <clears throat> so you notice the first time that the father quotes this or says this, he says, my son, my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. And this, um, this view of his son, and that's, that's speaking of the prodigal, this view of his son is in relationship to how is that son that is born again related to my son who is meant to be the life of the believer. How is he related to that? Well, he wasn't related to him very well because all of his actions went his own way and had his own ideas of how to live for the father or for himself. And um, so the, it, was, uh, it was viewed by the father in a particular way, and that was that this my son, my son, meaning the one who was born into the family, is both lost and dead. That that's, that was the way that the father viewed the relationship of this born-again son with the son who was meant to be his life, is meant to live in him. And um, <clears throat> so as I began to meditate on that, I thought about it, and I thought, you know, he was lost. He, he was lost in that he was wandering. And maybe, you know, maybe the prodigal son didn't think he was wandering. I bet you anything he didn't think. When he left the father's house to go make his way, he, w he didn't think, I'm wandering. He probably thought, well, I'm, 
I've got the father's goods, remember? The father gave him his goods, so this is God goods, you know. And it wasn't godless goods. <clears throat> but without Christ being formed in us as the son, without the son, without us being conformed to the image of his son, and that's what it says in Romans chapter 8. Um, and, and it calls that the purpose to which we're called. Those of who feel called to this, this is the eternal plan of God. Not, not that we, you know, evangelize the world or that we have great families or that we have all this kind of stuff, um, but rather that the sun began to be formed in us. And then you see that, in, of course, in Galatians, which we're all familiar with, where Paul is praying for the, the churches of Galatia. <clears throat> And they've got problems, and they're going through things, and <clears throat> there are issues, issues. I mean, if you can imagine a church having issues, but anyway, they, this, these people did. And there were issues, and, the, and Paul, in dealing with those issues, didn't sit down and do counseling or didn't go through a bunch of stuff, you know, courses and all this kind of stuff. He said, I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you, in you. Um, and this is, that right there, that's what we're really seeking. We're not, in other words, we're saved. I mean, if you're born again, you're saved, you know. Uh, somebody said to me, so what do you believe in? Once saved, always saved? And I said, well, I got saved once, and I plan on always being saved. So, yeah, I believe in that. You know, not, not the way you're talking about it, but the way that I, you know, I plan on sticking with, with the Lord, you know. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but the, the, um, the Father's view is the only view that's important. Yes. You know, really. I mean, because this whole thing really has to do with the son and therefore has to do with us being in the family. When we were driving here, I was just, I mean, the scripture, the Holy Spirit, of course, brought to remembrance when the disciples said, teach us to pray. And, and, and our mind goes to give us a religious way of doing this or tell us the right way, you know, to be right, elder son type stuff. Teach me the right way. And Jesus said, okay, pray this. Our Father, you have to come to him from the view of him being your father and therefore you being first a born-again son because you have to be born again uh, to be in the family. And then the forming of the son within us, which is the eternal plan. And uh, if you think about it, if... If, um, you know, if the plan of God was just getting saved, well, first of all, you know, that's, you know, we're, we're saved. We're, we have assurance of faith. But once that's done, that's where everybody starts picking through the Bible and going, okay, well, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's, you know. And Paul says, I pray that Christ be formed in you. That's, that's what he said. That's your hope as a church, Amen. is that you begin to relate to God as your father instead of just your God. And you can only do that by the son. That's why the son has to be formed in you. See, that's the purpose of that. And yet it's more than that because the relationship that the father and the son have, they had before the foundation of the world. And um, so... So there's that this the father's view is you're lost, you know. And his again, I think a whole lot of people are lost to not to salvation. They're lost to the eternal plan of God. They're lost to Christ being formed in them. They're lost to being a son of God by Christ. They are focused on a million other things, and they're leaving out the most important thing, which is what the treasure, the treasure, which is Christ in us but Christ being formed in us, you know. And so, <clears throat> so the father looks at it and he says, well, you know, to me, you're just wandering. All that you're doing, you're just wandering. 
And then the other factor is, is that there, there is, if it is just doing things for God, there's no real involvement with the father. Okay, this is the story of the father here, the prodigal son. He's the one who's wanting a certain kind of relationship with us. And he wants that by the son. And so in that front, it's like, you know, like we're dead. You know, we're lost and we're dead. And if every Christian really started thinking that way and started saying, you know, Lord, I mean, just like here, ask the Lord, ask the Father, is this true? If the stuff I'm saying is important to his heart, don't just listen to me, but ask the Father, is this important to your heart? And he will tell you yay or nay. And if he says I'm a heretic, then run as fast as you can from Thursday night class. But if, there's, but if the Spirit bears witness to that, then go a step further and say, Father, allow the Spirit of God to reveal the Son in me. To reveal the Son in me. Um, and once the Son is revealed in you, then we'll begin the Father-Son relationship. You remember the, one of the main scriptures we talked about was in um, Galatians 4, where God sends forth, because you are sons, meaning you're already born again, God will send forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father, not crying, I'm a, I'm a son of God. You don't cry. See, sonship is not about you. It's about the Father. It's not, I'm, I'm a son of God by Christ, or any, any of the terminology we would use that makes the focus back on us. You don't have to worry about the Father end of it. Let, ask the Spirit of God and ask the Father to reveal his Son in you. And make that a, and again, you don't have to wait till class is over to pray that. You can pray it right now. You can, you can hold these things. Don't let time go by when the Spirit might say something to you and then you go, I'll pray about that later because most of you won't. I mean, I don't. That's why I've, I'm telling you to do this. Get after it now. Stay as much as you can. Stay in tune. All right, and so... Um, then there's the, the uh, well, let me just draw it like this. Uh, there's the, there's the mental theology versus the mind of Christ. Mental theology can grasp these truths or at least hear them and go, the Spirit bears witness to me that that's true, and never live according to it. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not something to be grasped after, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And, you know, it's a spirit of selflessness. It's a spirit of, of lowliness. It's a spirit of humility, but it has nothing to do with studying lowliness or humility. It's, it's gain the nature of Christ and the mind of Christ, and those things come. Have you ever, anybody ever run into somebody that was very humble, and you perceived that that humility wasn't Jesus? It was just them trying to be humble, you know? It's like, and you go, hmm, you know. I mean, they were proud of their humility, you know, and that's, that's not good. Um, so mental theology uh, embraces right concepts, but it's lost to daily application. It, it wouldn't even think about in a situation where they were wronged or offended or done this or that or whatever, to take the lower seat in that situation. You know, it's like, take the lower seat when everybody's sitting at the table and thinking about who's gonna get the lower seat or something, you know what I mean? It's so, it, that's so much junk in us that, that's willing to do it when it'll make us look good. Really, you'll take the lower seat when it makes you look good. <laughs> Again, you know, Jesus would say, instead of come up here, he'd say, leave the room. <laughs> you know, we, we're not going to have this. <laughs> so, 
Um, so he says, this my son was dead, but now he is alive. And, and I thought, well, he, he was dead because he didn't breathe the things of the father's heart. You know, again, we can have mental theology and it have nothing to do with breathing the things of the Father's heart. Okay, so, you know, let's just, let's just paint a similar situation to the scenario when, that of the joke that I said at the first here. Um, okay, so when we go to heaven, what are we looking for? You know, I'm, I'm just painting that. So if when we get to the pearly gates, what are we expecting to see when they swing wide open for us? Well, gates of pearl, you know, and streets of gold, and, you know, then you're no different than, you know, anybody else on this earth. The one issue that makes it anything is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the one issue that makes it what it's supposed to be. And the last thing you want to do is step in and go, man, I don't know nothing about the Father. I just know Jesus saved me so I wouldn't have to go to hell. And the Holy Spirit made me dance during a worship service, you know. <clears throat> Our heart has to be towards the Father by the Son because the Holy Spirit revealed him in us. Amen? Amen. That's the flow. That's the flow. What, what number did you raise up just a second ago? Okay, it's a four. Gosh, I thought I was doing good. I was going to get a one. <clears throat> um, so verse 32 says this, and he said unto him, son, and you remember that word is actually uh, immature one, immature child in the Greek. It's not actually a son. Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was fitting, it was meet, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. It was right that we make merry, but you don't understand this because you're an immature one. You don't get this. Um, but he's bringing it up to the, to the brother because the first commandment is toward God and the second one's towards one another. Uh, I'm going to try to read a translation that I did sometime back of Romans 5, um, uh, verses 5 through 10. I've added a little link to it by trying to get across what I feel like it's saying. This is what the love of God looks like, which has also been poured into our hearts by God's Spirit in order that we might also give it out, the love, out to the undeserving around us. While we were adrift from God, off track with the things that mattered most to his heart, and generally showed no respect and no desire to be to God or to give to God what he needed most and what he rightly deserved from us, at our worst point, Jesus died for our sakes so that he might remove all the negative consequences that were surely headed our way because of our mistreatment toward him and others. How contrary is that to that of regular humans? With fallen mankind, it is extremely unusual if we would give up our precious life in the place of even a righteous man, though a few might possibly die for a good man. But God is not so selective. Jesus shows us the difference of God's love in that though he was perfect and with no hint of lack or failure, along with having every right to expect better from us, he treats us as if we were something special and worthy of God himself dying for us. Not that we were, that's how he treats us. And now, as those who have become justified through his blood and by it have been placed upon a higher spiritual plane than we were before, how much more shall we be saved from God's deserved wrath due us based upon hurts inflicted, things done or said that reflect a lack of truly understanding him and other offensive too, offenses too numerous to count? that deserve rejection, isolation, 
and on his part toward us payback that would cause others to think less of us and would bring about the kind of hurt and suffering that we caused him. For though by these things we all were as Jesus' murderers and his bitter enemies who brought about his death, yet in that same unfair and unjust death, God turned it as his tool to reconcile us. But if reconciliation is a great thing to us, how much greater it will be to God that having been put back upon an amiable basis of relating, he also now gives us his life so that from within this self-humbling life may transform us from the life we once lived, saving us from the horribly self-serving attitudes and reactions we once demonstrated toward those who failed us. In this way, we are saved by his life. All right, we're taking a break. Kelly just gave me a zero.